marketing first. Thank you so much, Sam, and welcome everyone. I know there's uh, plenty of macro informational sessions available out there, and we're just hoping to really hone, hone in on this um, particular session on the pertinent calls to action um, that, that may affect you as either a payer or a provider or just depending on your position in, in the world of change that, we're, that is upon us. Specifically, we are, we are going to um, try to hit some objectives uh, in this session. The first thing we're going to do is give you a general overview of the four categories of value-based payment. Uh, just as a level set, and then we're actually going to talk about the role of effective data capture so that we can uh, actually determine the value of services uh, and accordingly issue healthcare reimbursement that, that is purchasing value over volume. And then the last thing that we're going to focus in on on this particular webinar is the strategies that we would encourage you, depending on again, your role in, in healthcare in the U.S., but strategies to adopt health IT and, and use that IT so that you can better align with these changes, particularly those that are being impacted by macro. So, uh, Rhonda, I know there's, uh, those are the objectives for today. How are we going to achieve this, if you don't mind telling us our agenda? Sure, so why don't we start off first, um, Adele, with value-based payment. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, VBP, um, and we're going to go then further into the macro final rule with some details that you might need to know about that. And then we're going to actually talk about some essential strategies of, even though we're in this state of uh, uncertainty right now, what we can actively engage in now to make sure that we're protected in the future. And then we're going to talk a little bit about our payment model work group um, and open it up for any questions and answers. Um, Adele, I know that you have been actively engaged in value-based payment, so tell us some more about that. Well, you know, it's all about uh, federal reform, and Jesus, Pete, Rhonda, what a big topic that is, right? And it's going, we, we've been under federal reform officially for eight years, but really any of you who were on the phone today, and I'm an old timer, I've, I've been in healthcare for over 25 years, we have been trying to reform our, the way that uh, healthcare is orchestrated in the U.S. for decades. I mean, at least that's what I've experienced, Rhonda, how about you? No, it's it's absolutely uh, correct. We've, we've worked towards all of these and in some instances, we just need to really talk about some paradigm shifts. Uh, from the provider standpoint in our world, um, we've not really understood where the data is pooled or what we need to do to make things work. And so sometimes this is just kind of a get our head out of the get our head out of the sand and actively engage. And so it's. Just that paradigm shift of where where does the data come from and how do I get good data into where it needs to be? Uh, exactly. And so when we look at the fact that we're trying to change, use that data so that we can uh, redesign the way that we deliver care, change the way we pay for care, you're right, Rhonda. Data is kind of the, the central the, the cog that turns the wheel, shall we say, and, and of course, in healthcare, claims data is the most foundational data we have. Now, I don't know how many providers that we have on the phone today, but one of the epiphanies that I had about four or five years ago, I grew up on the payer side. And if you work on the payer side and have always worked on the payer side, it's not hard to uh, make the connection between claims and data. But for providers, if you've always worked in the provider side, providers typically view their claims process as a means of getting paid. And it is, right? You know, that's sending claims, I get paid. But really the mental shift that I think we are asking providers to make, especially as we reform the way we pay for care, is what they're actually doing in that claims process is reporting information to the people that pay them. Uh, and this gets lost in the shuffle with things like nonspecific coding and uh, things of that nature. So if we think of claims 
this is kind of the level set. It is absolutely has been what drives the economics of healthcare for decades. You know, you have demographic information, you have all these data points on a claim, and then you have the codified machine readable answer to two questions, Rhonda. What did you do? How do we answer that, Rhonda? <laughs> so we answer with um, sometimes I just don't know. Procedure code, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> exactly. right. It's but a, but we use the code a, set, right? Right, absolutely. And and then and then the and then if if I answer that with a you know, I did a chest X ray and then the next question is why did you do it? Um, how do we answer right. that? Uh, I we, we do that, right? Yeah, exactly, with our diagnosis codes. Um, and, and I will tell you that from from the provider's standpoint, sometimes the uh, well, a lot of times our claims data right now just isn't the best that it could be. Exactly, and so so this is a means of communicating with the people that pay you. So, but even if I was doing a good job, so let's say that I put an E11.8 on a claim. Um, everyone that's on this call today probably knows that I have classified that patient as a diabetic, for example. But Rhonda, does that tell me anything about their last day one C, or their BMI, or their blood pressure? It really doesn't, right? It it does not. You're correct. And and so under the Bush administration, there was a program that got launched that said, okay, providers voluntarily send me your information. Um, the most prevalent program for this was the Physician Quality Reporting Initiative, which then became a full-blown system. And so, you know, so that I can get that clinical information to further qualify what's going on with the patient that they're caring for. And once I have that information, I'm going to pay them to get it to me. And so this is really the Meaningful Use program, right? And as we looked at Meaningful Use, you had to report clinical quality measures, uh, both from hospitals as well as providers. And now that I have that information, I can begin to define value. And value will be defined as a function of the quality of care that's, that's delivered. Again, looking at our paradigm shifts, we want to change the way we deliver care. And the efficiency, most prevalent measure there being cost, with which we deliver that care. And based on that, under MACRA, I'm going to pay one of two ways. I'm either going to pay uh, differentially through the merit-based incentive payment system, which is a category two arrangement, we'll talk about that, or I will pay through a risk-bearing arrangement under an alternative payment model. And this will lead to affordable quality health care for all Americans. So this is kind of the trajectory we've been under through uh, recent times. Now, I love to refer to all this legislation as the Hippomipatrica Arapacamacra era, which is how <laughs> providers feel, right? Um, and it's just a little bit overwhelming, but so MACRA has really honed in from a federal perspective, Rhonda, um, on making this happen for traditional Medicare. Do you mind telling us a little bit more about that? Sure. So, um, right, just the basics here. We know that it was enacted in April of 2015. It was bipartisan, bicameral Medicare cost containment law. Um, it specifically had really um, mandated two Medicare value-based provider pay payment paths, um, which has caused a little bit of confusion in, in the industry um, for the provider side as to which one do I qualify for and where do I go. Um, so the first is our merit-based incentive payment program, but best known as MIPS. Um, that's where the payment is really based on the measures of quality and value. And then we have the advanced alternative payment models, or our APMs, which are more risk-based, um, con contracting with our providers for those defined services. And then beginning um, in 2017, um, with a, statue, a statutory excuse me, effective date of January 2019, um, so they've already started measuring performance under either one of these models uh, through, through our data and, and those types of things. Um, so just a basic, and Adele, I know you work a lot with health plans. What kind of trends are you seeing out there in the industry? Well, that's, that's 
a good question, Wanda, because really um, what I hear from providers is, well, the, I just won't do traditional Medicare. But the truth of the matter is if we look across the industry these trends are in place the the, the puck is moving in this direction and really the smarter way to position for this is to skate to the puck right so we have first from a federal standpoint just what you went over we've got a uh, macro and macro creates these two payment pathways MIPS the merit-based incentive payment system according to the final rule which was issued in uh, late October, it, they expect this to impact roughly about 80. Per, I'm sorry, 90 percent of the clinicians that are out there. Now, be aware, Rhonda, that this, as you know, doesn't just impact physicians. This is uh, other billable types of Medicare providers, um, and they. This is budget neutral, so they're expecting somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 uh, to 321 million to shift from low scoring providers to high scoring providers based on those measurements of data. Now the law itself actually appropriates an additional $500 million to reward what they deem exceptional performance. So this uh, gives HHS, particularly CMS, the ability to reward, I like to call them the poster children, of how this should be done. For more advanced markets, NACRA creates that second pathway of an advanced alternative payment model. And again, they expect very few to actually qualify for this because to your point, Rhonda, it requires more than nominal risk bearing. So this will be a true risk bearing arrangement even though quality and value are still being measured. And they, this, if you are a qualified participant with one of these APMs, you immediately get a 5% incentive for having achieved a risk-bearing arrangement with CMS and they're expecting to pay out somewhere in the neighborhood of 333 to 571 million dollars in those incentives. But you know Rhonda we've also see, seen policy shake out of the previous administration where they have been testing different models of uh, value-based payment and now beginning to mandate uh, those models uh, be put in place for traditional Medicare, specifically in the area of orthopedics and cardiology. So, so we, that's what the federal government is doing. But when we look across, we're seeing these trends be adopted by uh, adopted by other industries. So, like in the pharma world, Merck with their uh, diabetes types of of um, care, they're actually starting to uh, uh, contract with uh, payers from a value-based perspective where they are tying reimbursement through the rebate uh, mechanism for what outcomes they are achieving. And so they're really holding, starting to hold pharma accountable for uh, outcomes that line, align with the clinical trials that they talk about. We also saw this in Cigna. You have uh, Santa Fe and Amgen. They, they actually, on their cholesterol inhibitors, the cost of those drugs is pretty high. It's about $14,000 per patient per year. So they want to see that reduction in the LDLs. And if they don't, then these two pharmaceutical companies are not going to be reimbursed. But you know, Rhonda, what that means, the person that administers this therapeutic, they better be documenting the adherence or lack thereof because it will impact pharma's reimbursement. And when we look to this year on the high targeted drugs that they're putting under value-based payment, they're really focusing in on hepatitis C and some of the uh, uh, oncology, uh, hemonc types of uh, therapies that they have out there. Uh, likewise, in the commercial side, Blue Cross the, and Blue Shield plans are well underway with their value-based uh, payment models. Now, this is a little bit dated um, information from the association website, so I'm sure it's gone even further down this pathway than what I'm showing here. But in 2015, they indicated they already had contracts in place with uh, 327 ACOs in 41 states and DC, um, but very heavily involved in the patient-centered medical home initiative where they are rewarding 
uh, performance and infrastructure. United Health Group just uh, previously in last year rewarded almost 2,000 primary cares for differential payment uh, with about $150 million. So if providers want to make more, it's about measuring up. And when we look to government sponsored programs like Medicare Advantage, we're starting to shift, see the shift in policy here towards that value-based uh, payment mechanism um, through the call letters. They are, they are asking that the um, Medicare Advantage plan start reporting on the four categories of value-based payment. They don't call them categories, but they align perfectly with that. And they've even loosened up some of the regulatory requirements that everybody have exactly the same flavor and benefit by offering or extending the value-based um, insurance design model uh, in seven states uh, this year, and then they're going to expand that even further in three states in 2018. And when we look at Medicaid, manage Medicaid, where we're privatizing Medicaid, states are getting in on the act as well. And it's all over the board what's going on. They're going from, um, I'm just going to expect a certain percentage of my payments be value-based to very prescriptive, this is what you have to do and everything in between. So lots of variance there since it's run by state legislation. But generally speaking, the, the philosophical, I'm just not going to see medic, traditional Medicare patients, what I'm seeing run is you really cannot hide from this. And so here comes our new administration, right? Uh, we've got President Trump that's come in, and boy, it's hard to keep up with all the activity that's going there. Rhonda, tell us a little bit about what you think this administration represents. Well, so from what we've seen, um, you know, it, it, and he still hasn't been through the, completely through the vetting process. As early as today, we see where they're halting voting on it. And, but he's pushing for um, having Representative Tom Price uh, head up uh, HHS. What we do know is that he's for affordable, accessible, and innovative care. Um, I know that in watching the sessions where they were vetting him uh, last week uh, and some of the questions that were posed to him, one of the things that stuck out in my mind of, of where he's going to make some changes is he's very much, much against having to have the provider with his back to the patient while he's getting all of this documentation for some of these hurdles and, and looking for ways to reduce that. Um, they're against government forced coverage health health care increases that are under Obamacare and they are proposing um, less government more patient centered solutions that drive affordability, um, their choice, their innovation, their quality and their responsiveness that's out there. Um, those are the things that, that we know or we think we know, um, but uh, talk to, uh, about us about some of the results here, um, Adele. Well, you know, I think, I think we can all take it to the bank that Trump's a businessman, right? You know, he's a populist candidate that has, uh, or he was a populist candidate that now is in office. Um, but being a businessman, I, I don't think anybody is expecting, you know, him to shift away, Rhonda, from wanting value for the dollar. I just don't see that happening. So uh, he has campaigned and definitely so far very quickly lived up to all of his promises on the campaign trail. Um, so I think we can expect payment innovation to continue. Now MACRA, the, what we're talking about today, is a bipartisan, bicameral law. It, it has support on both sides of the aisle, uh, but it takes a very firm stance in moving the federal government in uh, the direction of purchasing value over volume. Um, it mandates that um, that type of reform. The only thing that I think we have to keep an eye on is uh, he wants less government, as you said. That was what he proposed in his campaign. And we just yesterday, he, ex he uh, issued another executive order, the, you know, uh, the one on, two off on regulation. So where any agency uh, can through you know and comply with law. If they put a reg out there, they got to take, they got to repeal too. Um, so what this says to me, and of course this is the world according to Adele, is that 
we can expect things to be less prescriptive. And if that happens, I think we can expect a lot more variance, which can lead to a lot more confusion. So it becomes very important that we um, keep an eye on what, what is coming out of this administration from an evolutionary standpoint. But Rhonda, what I think I'm going to do is just go ahead and educate everybody on what we know and, and you know where we are so far and I think that we can expect these trends to continue although the details it, it remain to be seen shall we say so shall I go ahead and start with the categories of value-based payment yeah the only thing that I have to add there Adele is on his strategy of uh, one in two out my husband tried to employ that same strategy with me you know, with my shoe purchases and I can tell you from that standpoint where you buy one pair and you, and you have to throw another pair out right it, it did not necessarily meet his objectives um, just something for us to keep on mind but let's talk value-based purchasing. <laughs> Somehow you ended up with more shoes? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how that works but uh, an interesting analogy. Okay so let's get into the, the uh, categories of value-based payment. So when Secretary Burwell, under the previous administration in January of 2015, announced that she was turning up the gas, so to speak, on traditional Medicare, moving it towards value-based payment, uh, she formed the Healthcare Payment Learning and Action Network that you see down here. And I would encourage you to look at some of their materials. These are wonderful thought leaders, just really smart people. But one of the white papers that they put together, they call it the four categories of, of population-based payment, but it really shows an evolutionary pathway that we all need to consider. So if I've got a contract, if I'm a provider or a payer, and I have a contract in place where we agree to a fee schedule, and if the benefit is there, I pay or accept according to that fee schedule, nothing further, that is a traditional type of arrangement and we call that a category one agreement. If, however, I am adjusting what gets paid based on measurements of quality and value, I pay differentially, that is a category two payment arrangement. If I am starting to pay across the care continuum, still on a fee-for-service type of architecture that we start to put risk out there, like in a bundled payment for an episode of care, or across the care continuum through an accountable care organization, that is a Category 3 arrangement. And if that ecosystem, that community, is accepting risk for either conditions or entirely, comprehensively for an attributed patient population, that is a category four arrangement. Now Rhonda, as you know, as we move through this, there are all kinds of data and operational complexities that come out of this, and it becomes very incumbent upon us to try to master those complexities, so to speak. So if I am a payer or a provider, and most of my arrangements are here in a category one, and I want to move my uh, network or my providers or my arrangement to uh, modernization, so category four, there's a logical process by which I need to follow. So the first thing that a payer should do is really pay for infrastructure. And we see this uh, coming out a lot through uh, like the medical home incentive programs that a lot of payers put out there. What they're doing, what it takes for a primary care to actually step up and get recognized or accredited as a medical home under the various programs requires tremendous infrastructure, re, uh, practice redesign, that sort of thing. Meaningful use is another one. It, it required the adoption of electronic health records. And so what starts to happen in these types of infrastructures is they begin to look at data and they begin to amass stores of data. So the next thing I want to do is pay the, that network to report the data to me. Um, now this may be through a claims process like uh, is available uh, still under the physician quality reporting system. Uh, it is it is also uh, could like meaningful use clinical quality measures but I want it doesn't really matter what the data says just get the data to me in a machine readable format and then the next thing I will start to do is reward my high 
performers and say, hey, look, there's an incentive if you measure up to this level. And then you begin to penalize your low performers. And based on this, this differential payment, I am now tying economics in healthcare to data points. And what do you think, Rhonda, starts to happen to providers when I start to tie dollars to their data? You start to they get start my attention. To pay attention. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. So now I'm going to move to the next level where I'm going to challenge them to start getting paid across that ecosystem through an alternative payment model. Now, at first, this may just include upside gain sharing. For instance, the Medicare Shared Savings Program, the ACO contracting, CAT Track 1 contracting for ACOs with uh, CMS has no downside. If, if they hit or fall below the target spend for, for the attributed population and they hit their, their quality metric, metrics, they get that upside. But then eventually I want to move them to downside risk sharing. Um, this is the same thing for a bundled payment where I'm sharing that risk across the ecosystem for a fixed price for an episode of care. Um, once I start to pay across the care continuum, I'm challenging them to start uh, taking a look at a shared patient within their uh, community. And this requires uh, care coordination, it requires transition of care and it requires the use of data to measure how everyone is performing for a related patient. Then they're ready to take on that, that risk. Now we knew this, if you've been in healthcare for any time, is capitation. But because we are now strongly measuring the quality and value of services, this is now deemed population-based payment where I will pay maybe a condition-specific fixed rate for a, a range of services or even get into comprehensive population-based payment. So if we break these categories down, you basically categories one and two are non-risk bearing arrangements. Essentially, I do a service, I'm still going to get paid something. As we move into categories three and four, I'm challenging these providers to share risk, to begin to uh, coordinate care for a, a population and think beyond their four walls. So if we take these um, categories of payment and look at what the predominant models are that are coming out, the ones that fall into fee-for-service, these are just some of the common ones that we're seeing, and then we have the risk-bearing arrangements. Essentially, category one arrangements are going away. And this is, you know, more so the case in some markets it's another, you know, I live in Alabama. Uh, sorry for anybody else that lives in Alabama, but, you know, if the world's going to end, move to my state because uh, it takes 20 years for anything to get to my state. We don't like change, you know, but it will get there. And so category one is going away, which means we're seeing these categories two to th four arrangements in the industries that are evolving. So keep that in mind as you uh, start to move through um, this evolutionary cycle. So uh, Rhonda, that's kind of the categories. What do you think we need to uh, address next? I think it's a good segue into the final rule for MACRA um, and what really is um, going to drive what we're really calling a quality payment program, right? Um, where we right, that's to what they call it. Yep, well, uh, where we're hoping to get to. Um, but let's take a look at MACRA by the numbers, Adele. Okay, sure, sure. So um, it's not always the number of words or the number of pages, right? Um, MACRA right. It itself is 95 pages long, but then when you dig into it, right, that could lead off to other legislation that's a couple of thousand pages. Um, and so um, it's what's the details in, in the actual words themselves. So um, there's 31 mentions of reasonable cost reimbursement. And so this is where we're going to start to tie in those quality payments. Um, 18 mentions of risk. And um, we can certainly talk about uh, all the risks that are uh, involved there. But then 27 uh, mentions of EHR technology to manage, measure, and report. 
and measurement I think is, is really important for us uh, to really discuss. Um, eight mentions of meaningful use, 38 quality measures, uh, again, right, back up to the uh, EHR technology, um, 19 resources for use of, uh, or efficiency, um, and then 171 measures or measurements, and then 103 instances of data. So even though it's 95 pages long, it really refers to a lot that we've already been doing in the industry or where we really need to go um, as we're moving forward. And so um, there's a lot of different uh, payment reform models and, and those types of things that tie along with that. And do you want to go ahead and talk about those, Adele? Absolutely. And, and I think you're right, Rhonda. I think it is, if you look at a you know, less than 100 page bill, anytime, anytime they talk about 171 times and data over 100 times, it's not hard to figure out what's going to be driving this economic future, right? So if we if we look at our category, yeah, our predominant payment reform models that we just got done talking about, basically macro, which you're right, it's the QPP, the Quality Payment Program. That's what CMS is calling this program. It really has those two tracks, and the merit-based incentive payment system is really coming in on that category two arrangement, whereas the advanced alternative payment models is coming into that categories three and four arrangements that have that more than nominal risk-bearing factor uh, met. Now, in 2017, recognizing that this uh, rule is uh, Fairly fresh. Uh, it, it hasn't. The ink has probably dried at this point, but it just came out the end of uh, October, and I believe it was 2,400 pages long. So the devil's in the detail. They recognize that it's going to be hard to ask providers to get ready for this, and so they've deemed 2017 a quote transitional year, and that's really all they. Uh, gave us a lot of detail on um, in this 2400 page final rule. So there's essentially, there is five options, one option being I'm not going to do anything, but I'm not going to consider that an option. So if we look at the options that a provider has in 2017, there's four four ways they can go. They can, they can take the strategy of I just don't want a penalty, because the, their performance in 2017, remember, is going to impact how they get paid in 2019. So I can say all I want is status quo, or I can say I will do MIPS, the Merit-Based Incentive Payment System, but I don't have my ducks in a row, so I will have a delayed start. Or I can say I'm ready to go, I've been following this stuff, I've got my act together, or I'm in a more advanced market and participating through that advanced alternative payment model. So if my strategy is just penalty avoidance, they would have to submit their data by the end of March before Q2 of 2018. Um, it needs to be 90 days of continuous data. And all they have to do, Rhonda, in this transitional year is just report one quality measure or one clinical practice improvement activity or the required measurements for advanced care information. They do that and they're golden. They're not going to get hit with a penalty. Um, the second strategy that they can uh, take is I'm not quite ready, but I'm going to get there this year. So I am going to do the merit-based incentive payment system. Again, the same reporting timeline applies. But in this case, they would report more than that minimum for just penalty avoidance. The next strategy that they could take is I'm ready to go. They do have their ducks in a row. They're asking for a full year of data. I think you can get away with 90 days. But to do MIPS, to truly do it, you would need to report six quality measures. Um, you would need to report four uh, clinical practice improvement activities, or if you are a small rural or health professional shortage area, non-patient facing type of provider, you can just do two clinical practice improvement activities. And all the required are up to nine of the advancing care information measures. The other option, if you're not on this track, 
if you are on a CMS advanced alternative payment model and you are a qualified participant, when this is all driven by threshold, by volume, then you would be on you would not be subject to MIPS. Now remember, alternative payment models are in all various shapes and sizes. So I could be in an alternative payment model like an ACO that doesn't contract with CMS. In that case, I would not qualify for this. I could be in a contractual relationship with uh, CMS in an alternative payment model. We'll just use the ACO example, but I'm on track one. I'm not bearing any risk. In that case, I would not qualify for this track. It's a very small percentage that is bearing more than nominal risk that qualifies, and we'll get into that in a second. Now, again, on the MIPS side, uh, Rhonda, they are, are calculating a composite performance score, a CPS, all these new acronyms, and they're basically putting, this is a, a, a weights performance across four uh, categories for the CPS. The first is quality measures. We also have resource use of cost. They've got this new category of clinical practice improvement activities and then advancing care information. So if we look at these quality measures, this is the formal program formally known as physician quality reporting system. That now is going to be this category for this uh, CPS score. Um, obviously, it's the claims that will drive the cost factor, and this will actually replace the value-based payment modifier under the Affordable Care Act. Uh, clinical practice improvement activities is new. If a, uh, qual if a provider is uh, accredited or recognized as a medical home, or if the provider is a uh, NCQA patient-centered specialty recognized provider or practice, they get full credit for this category. Otherwise, they would select from 93 available activities. And then the advancing care information category, and this drives me crazy a little bit, they of course don't call it meaningful use anymore because that's what everybody recognizes, but that is exactly what it is. It's the formal, former, meaningful use program. So all of these federal programs that uh, have had their own little swim lanes, if you will, are now coming together to create this composite score. And in this first performance year, 60% of the weight is going to come from those quality measures. They are not going to give any weight to the claims. They're going to provide that for feedback information only in for this year, and then 15% from clinical practice improvement and 25% on how well you adopt and meaningfully use your health IT. As we move forward into 2018 and 2019 performance years, again with a two-year lag on the application and impact to your reimbursement, you see a shift under the quality measures and resource use where it, it starts to weight equally by 2019 for a 2021 uh, performance year of 30% and 30%. Your clinical practice improvement activities and advancing care information are static. So uh, they really start to measure up to that formula of value is a uh, function of quality and efficiency. Um, so you start to really see that play out. But that is how the score is calculated. Now what they do is they will adjust to the positive or the negative in a budget neutral fashion for CMS based on points. So based on the information that is, is reported by that particular provider or group, they will earn points that will range from zero to 100. Now, um, they are now, they don't call them eligible uh, professionals anymore. They've changed that term as well. These are ECs, eligible clinicians, and they can choose to perform as many or none of the categories. Of course, if they don't do anything, they are going to get the maximum negative adjustment that's allowed under MACRA. Now, all we really know about is 2017, and this is how low they have set the bar, Rhonda. If that provider will just report one quality measure, for example, they will get three points and not be subject to an adjustment. If they do more than just one quality measure, 
manager, they start to earn more than fee schedule. So just 3.1 all the way up to just under 70 points, and they're going to get more than fee schedule. They're going to see a, an, an increase in how much they earn in 2019. Um, and then if they get above 70, and if we take this academically, if they make a C or higher, um, they start to become eligible for that, that uh, piece of that $500 million. Now, this is as the policy stands today. We do have a new administration. Of course, he has made it very clear that if they put a new policy out there, they've got to pull two off. So. Um, so we've got to keep an eye on that, but really this is this is where the policy is right now. Now, if you're if you um, are in an APM that's contracted to CMS and you need to know whether that is an advanced APM that qualifies for that other track or a MIPS APM, um, it really it you are not in an advanced APM. There's a threshold. So if your volume threshold is less than 25% of your Part B payments or less than 20 percent of your Medicare patients, then you are not in an advanced APM. You are still could, would be eligible for MIPS. And this is the way we've got to kind of think about it. If I want to make more than fee schedule, then what I can do as an APM is opt in to MIPS. They can choose to opt out, but if they opt in and they score well and you see how low that bar is set, then they will make more than the minimum payment. If, however, my volume threshold is over, equal to or more than 25% of your Part B payments or over the more or equal to 20% of your Medicare pay, uh, pay patients, then you qualify as an advanced APM and you are a qualified per participant and therefore not subject to MIPS, and you would instantly be eligible for that 5% bonus payment. Now, under the law, MACRA specifically defines this advanced alternative payment model as a CMS Innovation Center model, non-award projects only. It will include uh, Medicare Shared Savings Program ACOs, but only where they're sharing in that risk. So track one would not be eligible. Um, it's re really looking at track two and next generation. Those are the ones that will be eligible. If you're in a demonstration under the healthcare quality uh, demonstration program, you might be eligible and or a, some other demonstration required by law. They also have to meet these three criteria. The, a certain percentage, it's 50% for this first year, of the qualified participants have to be used in certified electronic health record technology. The measurements for quality on that APM have to be comparable to what they're using in MIPS, and they have to bear that more than nominal financial risk or be an expanded medical home. And this is where we're getting into the CPC Plus program. Specific programs called out in this final rule that do qualify in 2017 for this alternative, uh, advanced alternative payment model is tracks two and three, uh, next generation ACO. Uh, those are all qualified. If you're in the comprehensive ESRD care um, type model, you qualify. Uh, if you are contracted in your state and, and you're participating in the CPC Plus program, which they've just recently taken applications, you could qualify. Or if you're in the oncology care model and moving into that two-sided risk sharing starting in 2018, you would qualify. Now, as they try to um, uh, administer this and really qualify more of these APMs as advanced models, they have set up under this final rule a PTAC committee, uh, which is an 11 member uh, board that uh, really evaluates these programs and then they make recommendations to HHS on whether they think it's a scalable model that should qualify as an advanced APM. They don't make that determination, but they make those recommendations. So there is a vehicle to take a look at that. I know that's a lot. Rhonda, uh, that that I just went through, but um, you know, that's how it's playing out. 
Yeah, I mean, I can tell you, even as intimately involved as I am on the processes and reading up on everything, it still makes my head spin. And you did a really good job of, of spelling out exactly what's covered and what's not covered. Um, I can tell you, um, from a provider standpoint, um, we struggle a lot. And we think we're doing the right thing. And, and I'll tell you, January of almost every single year is when I start to get phone calls from practices that thought that they were reporting or doing the right thing and they've gotten the letters. And trying to fix that and repair it is, is a little bit difficult, especially always after the fact. So for me, talking about strategies on how we can um, mitigate some of this, because we know that there's still a lot that's in flux. And we know that there's probably still going to be changes made to the program uh, once price is confirmed. But there's lots of things that we can do now um, that can help mitigate that and, and help all of us be prepared for when all, it all starts to come into play. Um, but Adele, can you talk to me about what you've seen about different market approaches? Sure, you know, and, and and I think you're right, Rhonda. I think uh, you know, great. That's a summary of the rule. But what does it mean to me? And I think it varies. The strategy is going to vary depending on what type of stakeholder you are, right? Because the call to action, like you hit, you hit it on the on the head for a provider. Um, it's it's over. Overwhelming, you know, they are in the midst of the hip and hippotrica or a pack of macro era, and it, it is just overwhelming trying to figure out how to put these pieces together. But let me tell you, it's the same thing on health plan sides. I mean, there there it's a real call to action for them to modernize as well, and that means certain things. Now, um, back when we had our ICD-10, Deloitte issued a pay, uh, paper, Rhonda, that really resonated with me because I see this all the time, and I play on both the provider and the health plan side. And when we look at this, there's really, according to them, three camps that you're going to find uh, folks take with all this Herculean change that's out there. The first is this pragmatic approach, and as we like to say in the South, I'd rather have a rash over 70% of my body then do it differently than we've done it before. Uh, they call this the pragmatic approach. Um, these are usually in the provider world going to be the practices that wait till the end and health plans that wait till the 11th hour to modernize their technologies uh, and figure this all out. And they basically become obsolete. They're trying to slam in technologies, figure it out uh, right there at the last moment. They're aiming for the absolute bare minimum they have to do to comply. And they're at risk. And that's 60% of the market. Um, they said about 20 to 25% takes this collaborative approach. Well, okay, I see it. I may or may not like it. But let's do it. And these are the folks that take a plotted strategic uh, pathway in modernizing their processes, uh, making that culture shift. And they usually do okay. Very often they'll get uh, incentives associated with change that's being demanded. And then in the market you will find this small group, which is what they call the innovators. And as we like to Say in the South, that's like riding the gravy train on your, your, your biscuit wheels. You know, that's, that's where you want to be. That's good stuff. And this is usually the health plan or the providers that stand out in the market. They always seem to have their act together. They may not be perfect, but they embrace the change and they use all of this as a change agent. They use technology as a change agent to really redesign what they're doing. Uh, on those three marks, the way we deliver care, the way that we pay for care, and we use our data. Um, that is really where you want to be is in this last category. And it's tough because you'll have uh, people within your organization that's all over this chart as well, right? So it's a mental shift that uh, people have to take. And whether you're a provider or whether you're a payer, essentially the world we've been living in in a category one payment arrangement. In the provider world, I'm worried about getting my claims out the door, making sure that I don't have batches just sitting out there and that my money's coming back in. In the payer world, we want to make sure that the edits are looking at whether that claim makes sense, you know, under the ICD-10 rule and everything else. Um, and this is something that we've been uh, orchestrating uh, with it, and when I'm looking at that provider as an individual and just what they did with a patient. 
as we move into category two, we start to measure performance within that enterprise, that group practice, that provider enterprise. And based on whether that measures up to the positive or the negative, that will drive how we pay that provider. So it's all about the data at this point. Once I get them used to it, as we said in our evolutionary cycle, I want to start to introduce other alternative payment models um, where we start to pay across the care continuum for a shared patient. In this case, it's a real mental shift because we still have to keep an eye on what's going on at that individual level, but now it's also how are my efforts in sync with others that have to care for this patient. So we start to measure across the ecosystem and based on whether the ecosystem, be that an ACO, a CCO, an RCO, a, I mean pick your acronym, based on whether they perform well or don't perform well from a uh, uh, quality and efficiency standpoint, payment is distributed across that community um, accordingly. So it matters not just that I do the job, best job I can do, but that the hospital I work with also doing their job, or the specialist I work with, or the ancillary, whatever it is, be that in an epic of care or across the continuum even for comprehensive care for the patient. So it's a real shift. So Rhonda, what I would like to do is maybe go through what you and I have discussed as essential uh, strategies, um, just depending on what seat I'm sitting in, whether I'm a payer or I'm a provider. And the first thing that I think they need to do is assess. They, they've got to figure out where they are. It's on the payer side, it's no shocker, and I think every, the, the data supports this, that the industry is abandoning this traditional, I, you know, hold a provider to a fee schedule for these more advanced or modern models of value-based payment. And so the first thing I would say a payer wants to do is make sure they understand all arrangements that they have in, in place and how they shake out by those four categories. Now, if you're a Medicare Advantage plan, you're being asked to do this anyway. Um, and then this, is, the other thing that you want to think about is how are you going to prioritize prioritize um, performance measurements. And one of the things you want to try to do in, in that regard is align as much as possible with what you know that industry has, has to do anyway, because it will set your providers up for uh, success. But this essentially is going to help me formulate that strategic roadmap towards modernization. And the more that I can align like measurements with what we see the federal government doing, the more likely I'm going to set those providers up for success. So that's what I would recommend from an assessment standpoint for payers. How about the providers, Rhonda? Well, from the provider side, right, first we need to acknowledge the fact that hope isn't a strategy. Um, we employed that with ICD-10, like you mentioned earlier, Adele, and many of us were left holding the bag with either increased costs because of vendor last minute readiness, trying to get everything ready, or we just weren't ready. Um, so we need to really kind of take this strategically, which is what we're spelling out here. Um, so we're going to assess. Um, we're going to take a look at all of our payer agreements. How are we contracted? Um, exactly how are we getting paid? What categories or what hoops are we jumping through now um, to get any quality improvements, extra points, um, those types of things? Um, and then overall, what is the health status of the patients that we treat? And so we want to really make sure that we take a look at overall of our processes and those types of things to get that roadmap of where we are, right, that dot on the map that says you are here. Um, and then we're going to uh, establish an ongoing reassessment as we look to make improvements um, and search for the answers to make sure we're not missing anything uh, as we're moving forward. And that makes perfect sense. And so once we do the, the essential strategy number one, the next thing I would recommend on the payer side is that you, uh, the next action is recognize. And the way that you want to do, what you want to do in that regard as a payer is, is what are the data points, what is the technology that you need as a payer to properly administer your value-based payment strategy? Um, 
are there new compliance data needs that you have uh, based on state legislation for, say, a managed Medicaid plan? Um, is the Medicare Advantage call letter asking you to do certain things? Um, do you have those data points and tools automated within your organization? And then the other thing is you want to be able to provide uh, or give that provider feedback on how they're measuring up because their ability to take care of the population population uh, that you have uh, will impact your HEDA scores. It will impact your revenue in the future. And then what constraints exist in your market? Um, you want to look at that by plan type. You want to look at that. It could be a cultural thing. Like I said, you know, here in Alabama, we hate change. Uh, we'd rather have a rash. So, you know, that might be something you have to take a look at and find a mechanism to mitigate. And what this is going to do is it's going to give you kind of a list, if you will, the critical systems, the data points that you need uh, so that you can be successful with your strategy. And this will position you so that you can begin the work of redesigning the workflows within your organization and the marketplaces in which you play. How about on the provider side, uh, uh, Rhonda, for, for recognizing what would you encourage them to do? Well, first of all, we need to recognize is that in some instances the detail is in our data, and that's the only way people can measure us through our claim submissions um, data, through our reporting mechanisms, um, which all boils down to uh, documentation issues. But we really need to take a look at um, the health plans we're contracting with. How are they prioritizing health management? And we want to really look at those types of things and um, right through our assessments, um, then we want to look at working with our provider relations reps. Um, a lot of times our specialty societies or state medical societies can help us with where the priorities are and, and where we're headed for. But we really need to take a look at all the programs and the timelines and then understand that um, our improvements come through documentation and through working through uh, those data points. So we're going to build that, that strategic roadmap that aligns our actions. Um, and a lot of times we can do that through frequency reporting, our top revenue sources. Take a look at those top plans and, and the types of patients that we're seeing and how that begins to align so that we can make strategic differences there. Well, that's very helpful. And so the next thing that I would encourage the payer side to do is identify. So what you want to do is identify um, what you need to manage your provider reporting requirements. And so uh, I would personally start with some type of a matrix of reports and required data elements that you need, and then um, find you know where is the source of truth today today on that and and what you may find as a payer is that there's multiple sources of truth and that can uh, add to the complexity of making this a reality within your organization um, you also need to define what is the, the the process that you're going to put in place to monitor quality and again I would leverage the things that I know these providers have to do already under macra for um, these federal initiatives. The more that you can align with that, if they're going to give that deal to the federal government, that's a deal that I would like too. Um, so take a look at that. Make sure you understand what's going in place in your, your market, not just with MACRA, but with policy initiatives that are already underway for some of these orthopedic and cardiac bundles and, and other initiatives that they've had out there. What this will give you is uh, a way to evolve your value-based design in the way that uh, you work as a, as a business. Um, and then I would consider very market-specific glide paths because if you play in more than one market, I guarantee you there are differences and nuances that you have to consider. What about on the provider side, Rhonda? We really need to take a look at our data point and understand where it all pulls from. A lot of us transition to, instead of doing manual reporting for quality measures that are out there now, we decided to do registry reporting, which takes that manual process out, which helps us make, uh, it's supposed to help us be more successful. Um, but what it actually does is essentially look at all the data in our, in our systems and, and pulls it in for us. And so it's understanding where the data comes and where it pulls in and then the output of it as well, who, who it's going to report to and where's it going to go um, to see if there's any type of 
overlap or information that we need to make sure that we're getting out. Um, specialists, for example, uh, I work with a lot of specialists that sometimes just forget to document or to include in the data that's going out uh, comorbid conditions of patients. And those are essential to managing the overall patient experience um, and tracking that data, uh, recognizing the complexity of our patients and those types of things. So we want to make sure that we have data points to be able to pull that information out. Um, look at the feedback of reporting that we get from our payers and those types of things. A lot of times when I go into a practice and I look at their overall global pictures and I want to do some type of practice transformation and improvements inside, one of the first things I do is take a handful of the remittance advices from the different payers because just by looking at that, I can identify where some of their key data uh, problems are and then be able to take an approach from, from looking at those. So you look at it from a workflow redesign, and um, you can take that and, and really kind of start to shift things um, as we're going down through. And that's, that's very helpful. And I know we're, we're getting past our time here, so I'm going to try to go through this last one pretty quickly. But the next call to, to action on the payer side is really educate, educate, educate. And that's internal, external. There's so many moving parts to this. And as a, a, a strong business, this is really a role that you can play within your marketplaces that you, um, that you work where you can educate um, staff. It, it, it's not even just uh, your providers. It's even on the internal side. There is a lot of things that are moving here. And if we can truly achieve this, we can create something that a better mousetrap, if you will, uh, for the, the, the person we all are trying to serve, which is the patient. Um, what this will result in uh, is buy-in in collaboration and if you do this education, if you talk about the data points that you need, why you need it and all of that, not only will you get that buy-in, but it will help you achieve the strong data harvest that you need so that you can achieve your reporting uh, like for HEDIS as an example and, and revenue management. Uh, this will, you want to establish this, um, an ongoing market assessment because as those markets evolve, the educational needs will shift. How about on the provider side, Wanda? On the provider side, um, we're going to apply the five right rule. Um, so I mean, I'm going to skip around here a little bit. Right information, the right data, um, in the right formats, the right technology channel, and the right time and patient workflow. But we also want the right person capturing. Um, and so I always try to uh, stress this point. Skill sets are important. Each practice is only as strong as their weakest staff members. So you need to make sure you have the right skills and resources in place so that you can actually make those improvements in your practice. Um, strong data is going to give us those strong improvements in performance that we are needing to go on. So we want to make sure that we train for consistent data capture so that everybody understands how important their piece of the documentation trail is um, for that ongoing improvement. So Adele, wow, you wow, the, the, yeah, it's a lot, right? <laughs> it, it is a lot. And so I was going to say, let's uh, wrap up here real quick with um, our Weedy Payment uh, Model Work Group. Um, so that we can um, get these fine people on with their day. So, um, no problem. Our, our, pro our payment model work group um, was launched back um, in April of last year. Myself, Adele, and Jay Sultan are the co-chairs for this um, work group. So we were charged with um, developing the framework for assessing, distributing, and educating the industry about the clinical core attributes um, for the value-based reimbursement models and we're including existing or needed technology solutions that can um, mitigate barriers to the implementation and sustainability. We know that the industry has a long way to go before we can get the improvements we need and to be able to assist everybody along the way so that we can be successful just like we were with ICD-10 implementation. Our group meets on the fourth Monday um, of each month from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we would love for you guys to join us. It's just like any other work group. If you're not signed up, log in to, your, um, to the Weedy and make sure that you um, check for that, that work group and, and get our communications and their notifications because we would love to engage with you guys as we're moving forward um, in these really uncharted waters. Um, right and now, I agree. And Ron, 
Ron, one of the things that I'm going to ask everybody to do that's still on the phone with us, if you would like to be included in this, please indicate in your chat uh, portion of your webinar, and we'll make sure that we include you uh, in the meeting request for the uh, work group meetings that occur monthly. Thanks, Adele. Um, so our um, right now our work group has two focus groups. One is on the patient relationship codes and our members that we've had engaged are listed here on the screen as well. Um, we also have an education and collaboration uh, focus group as well. And so far we've had one call with each of those and we're working to get more set up with uh, really uh, some phenomenal dialogue and opportunities. So if you guys are interested in working in in either one of these focus groups, again, um, let us know and, and, and indicate that either here on the webinar or reach out to us after the webinar because we would love to be able to um, help you or, or have you help us uh, shape, the, shape the future with everything that we're going to do. Um, and with that, Adele, I'll, I'll turn it over to you for wrap up. Well, I think, uh, I think that's all we have for today. I know we're a little bit over our time, so I Thank everybody for hanging with us. It's just a lot of information to get through. Uh, Sam, do we have any questions that we need to attend to here? If anybody wants to uh, stay on, on the, um, the phone. Uh, so far, okay, we've just got one in. Um, Adele, what do you look for on the remittances? Um, in what context? Are you asking that? Uh, I don't know that I understand the question, Julie. Adele, I think that that question was actually aimed towards my comment that I said that I, when I go into oh, practice, okay. I look at a handful of the remittance advice. What I'm looking for. There you go. Are, yep. Uh, what I'm looking for are the communications back um, with rejections, um, whether they're for bundling of services, uh, payer trends and those types of things because I can look to those for continual improvement in the revenue cycle for the practice. Um, sometimes even to build workflow changes off, off of that as well. It looks like we had uh, Dr. Miller asked a question. This, this session was recorded, was it not, Sam? Yep, it is actually still being recorded and I will be uploading it onto the Weedy website and everybody that um, attended the live webinar, everybody that's registered, you'll get the link on how to download the webinar. Do we have any other questions? Well, if not, uh, again, I'd like to, uh, well, thank you very much, Dr. Miller. And uh, if, if you do have any questions, our um, contact information is right here on the screen. Feel free to email either myself or Rhonda directly. Uh, we're here to help and uh, really would love to have your feedback and participation in our work group. Thank you for those who have already raised their hand. Uh, can't thank you enough for joining in. I think it's going to take... It takes a village, right? It's going to take more than a village. It's going to take a country to make this all happen. So uh, thank you very much for joining us today. And I would especially like to thank Rhonda and Adele for being such fantastic presenters, getting a lot of great comments from our attendees. And also thank you and also Jay for being great co-chairs of the Payment Models Work Group. Um, definitely want to encourage everybody to join that work group. It's a fantastic work group. They get a lot done. It's a great conversation every month. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to email me, sholvy, H-O-L-V as in Victor, E-Y, at weedy.org. I'm more than happy to answer any questions and help you any way that